Um, so, you know, I thought, what was I thinking that I could encourage us tonight on? Because I was thinking, I come to church because I'm a disciple. It doesn't matter whether I'm speaking or not. I come to church because Jesus is the head of the body of Christ. And he says, be devoted. And we come together. And I always come with an expected heart going, I'm going to walk away encouraged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So whoever's doing it, like, and no matter what you're doing, you need to bring faith and receive faith. Mm -hmm. But it's God in the spirit who does it. Yeah. But we got to be willing. So I just figured, man, I thought maybe we could just, the, the, the little charge tonight would be home at last. We're not really home yet, but that's the ultimate goal. Home at last. We have a home in heaven. Home at last. And the beauties and joys of heaven are incomprehensible to the human mind at this time. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And, you know, Revelation is a powerful book. It talks about the future of what's still ahead and also, it helps the people, especially at that time, but even now, to make sense out of persecution. Not why is this happening, but uh, why not? I mean, this is, this is, don't be surprised. Persecution is part of really standing up for God on earth because people have freedom of choice. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Think about free choice that God gave the world. It's the most power, with so much power he gave us. And then he strived to help us see our nature and realize that even though he wants us with him, he demonstrated the incredible love through Christ to realize that, hey, I never wanted it to be that way. Mm -hmm. I tried to set up human beings in the garden of, in, in Genesis and tried to set it up where I'd be walking and have a relationship with you. I didn't play this like you're going to be in sin, but I got to give you free will because what is the most pure form of love? Free will. We know that as human beings. You don't want a friend because he's a friend with you because he, what he can get from you. That's not, that's not a good feeling. We see many times you see celebrities and wealthy people say it's really hard to have a friend because you always think someone wants something. Yeah. Same thing with God. He just wants a relationship. But we can't have one because his purity. So let's, look what he's got in store for us in verse 9. No eye has no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. You know, that's pretty powerful. You don't wait to die. You're excited when you walk with God because you can make sense out of all the failities. One thing I love about the Bible is it started making sense of the things I really didn't want to happen to me. The, the hardships, disappointments, frustrations, challenges, financial worries, all that stuff that's happened to all of us and is going to keep happening. The Bible says God, God's got you. He's not trying to hurt you, but it makes sense, doesn't it? Because he says, I've allowed or caused these issues to refine you and strengthen you. So now I, I just need to know that, that God's got my back and now there's a reason. Now I realize I'm excited to go into the problem instead of go, oh no. And that's the way most of the world does. It has no hope. They just wander through a problem. They don't know what to do. They're worried. You know what I mean? It's like we can go, wow, this is here for a reason. And, you know, Peter describes the blessing of heaven as an inheritance. And look in, uh, look in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Because we're here on midweek. We're disciples. or We're studying. But this is incredible. The Bible reminds us. He says here in, in, in 1 Peter let me get there. First Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4, it says here, And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance, is kept, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. See, the level of joy experienced the first moment we see God. Think about that. The first moment that you see God, it's, you're not, everything's going to be gone. All the things that you figured out, it's just done. Uh, and it sounds far too good to be true. Doesn't it? I mean, I don't know about you. I'm really grateful, but we can't really conceive it. But I just know death, I have peace. And I don't need to think about when I die or how I die. I just know death is part of my plan and every human being's plan. So I just know I don't need to think about that. God's got that. But I just know there's peace at that time. And now I continue to have peace in life. I can get back to peace. Um, but I, I thought we could look at uh, 
what I want to talk there is the destiny of the redeemed. And let's look at the let's look at uh, Revelations 21 1. The destiny point number one is the destiny of the redeemed. And I love digging in to different scriptures. And it says here in chapter 21, verse one of Revelations, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who has seated, he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You know, the new heaven and the new earth really signifies a new way of life because we live after we die physically. We're going to be in a spiritual body. And why it doesn't say a lot about that. You can get insights, but here he says a new heaven and a new earth. You know, we may be more surprised than we think when we see, we just know one thing, there won't be sin. And I love how it also says that there won't be tears, which means emotional pain, mental, emotional anguish, which really is the center of every issue that causes us. It's not the outside, it's how we perceive it. And then we get mentally and emotionally discouraged, yeah. frustrated, anger. It's really the emotional makeup that won't be anymore yeah. because there won't be any more tears, pain, crying. Because it's all how you perceive. It's what's going on in your head, how it's happening. Look in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Come on, Chris. Come on, bro. What will it really be like? Well, we don't fully know, but these clues are amazing. And look in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Wow. This is John, who wrote Revelations, carried by the Spirit, but saying, man, that's just powerful. He says, we are, we're children of God. We're saved. We're, we're God's family. And what we will be has not yet been known. But it's okay, right? Because we're in God's hands. It's okay. But it's kind of exciting. I'm glad it's not all laid out. I don't like to know. I like to have a little surprise for everything. I don't like to know everything. It just gets boring. I like to be excited with God. I just need to know God's good. He has promised great things and an eternal life. He says enough about it where, wow, I just would be so grateful to be there, but then the process. Peter wrote about our new environment in a, sim our environment in a similar way to Revelation 21. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Because we need to remind each other about why and what we're fighting for in our faith. Yeah. Walking with God is amazing, and that's why we even have to remind ourselves and think about your darkness when you were there. Because sometimes Satan tries to take the novelty and spin your brain a little bit and get you ungrateful. If you're ungrateful or you get into bitterness, it's really you got to go back and get in touch with who you really were and fully get all the and really get deep and go, who was I really? Because sometimes we can be deceived and go. No, life on the bad. No, it was incredibly. We were lost and we were heading nowhere and, and, and we were just basically living unconditional, on conditions of whether things go well or not, hope it works out. You know, and we were just, you know, we had no compass. Yeah. We lived for self. But in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear like a roar. 
the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in, done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? See, I love how the Bible asks us a question, but then it gives us the answer right after. It says, you ought to, be, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and, and speed its coming. That day will bring about destruction of the heavens by fire and elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So here Peter even reemphasizes what Revelation is, new heaven, new earth. And we know the Spirit's carrying both of them, giving them insight, God's Spirit. I love how when the Bible, when you really see that scripture, that always stops me in my tracks and gets me humble. Because you know when you're doing well, that's why when you read the Bible, you're great for everything. But you, you need to, you need, it, I need to be brought back to a level of humility, which I strive to be. But I got to be brought back where like scriptures like this just stop me in my tracks. And go, who am I? What am I even thinking? How dare I even be critical of one thing? And, and I need to gr just be grateful for everything, expect nothing. Because when it says, what kind, it says everything will be destroyed in this way. And it says, what kind of people ought you to be? Holy and godly. That would include humility. That would include not being self-righteous or critical or frustrated or impatient. I'm just stopped in my tracks. I don't know about you guys. It brings me back to just going, I'm just in awe of God. Because when you just get back to that center, everything is, everything, the smallest things that you maybe took for granted, you're grateful for again. The fact that you're here today. I asked uh, people in the staff yesterday, I said, what's the number one thing you're grateful for, and I think every disciple would say, my salvation and my relationship with God, eternal life. What's the second thing? And we came to a conclusion because Job, Satan attacked Job. He said, you got, he's doing well because you put a hedge around him. He's got everything going for him. He's the richest dude in the land. Everybody looks up to him. He's got respect, and he is known as the righteous, most righteous man. But take that stuff from him, crash his economical life, strip him, and let's see if he's still righteous. And he does that, right? And Job, in all this, it always ends. In all this, Job did not sin. That's the key. And you're like, oh my gosh. But then Satan comes back and goes, no. Nah. And what's he go after? His health. Because Satan has, has like amnesia on purpose, I think. Because he goes in every time. You look at the devil. The devil knows his time is short, but I just don't think. But the way he works at something. If I knew I was going to lose a game, who likes to watch a game if you're waiting to watch it on or you're recording it? Don't tell me the score. If someone tells you the score, can you really enjoy the game? Isn't, why, isn't that weird? We want to be on the edge, but if someone says, oh, you didn't see that, they won. Oh, I don't even want, I just, I've lost all interest. <laughs> it's the same thing, man. Same thing. See, God wants us to be holy and godly and then get back to there every day with grace. Get back there every day with grace. Job took his skin. He goes, skin for skin. He's going to scream out he's done. And if you think about it, your health. Aren't you grateful as a disciple still alive your health? What, what would you give if you lost your, your wealth, your car blew up, or, or take your, your legs or take your health or give you brain cancer right now? You were saying, I'm going to heaven, but what about the suffering through it? You're, you're shriveling down and you have to die slow in front of everybody. Because when cancer, you know, I mean, or whatever it is, think of it. That can happen. God could allow or cause that. So you need to be grateful. But then if it does happen, you've got to give glory to God because that's what Job did. He took it like a man, and his wife even said, I'm out. Curse God and die. She fell away. But he brought her back as he hung in there. You read that whole book. She hung in there. But think about it. Someone's got to stay faithful in all the misery. She said, curse. She goes, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God. Die. Why is he doing this? We serve God. We've been there. I've done all this. Why? And he says the most profound thing that all of us need to realize. It's the most profound words if you keep there. Holy and godly would say, woman, we came from our mother's womb with nothing. And we are going to die and take nothing. Are you just going to curse God only for good? I mean, only for bad and not good? He says the most profound thing. Isn't that true? Everything we have, instead of looking at the negative, is a plus. Even the brain and the body that God gave you, you can see. You've got to think about that. Especially since my health has been intact with this paralysis. I don't complain, but it just gets me to marvel because I realize what I could do. And now I have more of an attitude because of my faith. 
what am I learning to do and I'm going to do my best, but I got to grab my mind every day. I have emotional, like my, my daughter said it best. I said, I'm str- I have to capture my mind. She goes, you're fighting depression. <laughs> and I went, okay, just you know, give it right at me. It's true. <laughs> when tough stuff happens, I've never been a depressed person by nature, really, but I fight depression now. It's not, I didn't get it clinical. I'm not taking medication, but it's a powerful down spiral that you can get just from a hardship. And it's not just me. You guys can get that too. And that's why you got to go, hey, naked, I came from my mother's womb. And naked, I will leave this planet. So everything you have, give glory to God. Whether it's hard or not, give glory to God because you're saved. Amen? Amen. So the end of the sea marks the end of man's separation from God. And if you look in Revelation 4, verse 6, and, you know, these things, I love marveling at these things. And I don't, don't try, you can't, if you're trying to figure it out, you can think and think and think. I don't think we can, God put it where we can figure it all out, but it's fun to wonder. Because it says the heavens are going to burn up in fire. How can you light sky on fire, burn up, melt? I don't know. No matter how we think, a lot of people say, well, it's a nuclear power. And you know why that's probably not going to be? Because that's human reason. We don't really need faith because it just makes sense that the, the, the crazy animosity of, of the world and now people, more and more countries are getting you know, nuclear power and it is devastating. But I don't, think, I don't think we still have a clue how it's going to end. But we know fire will be involved. But it says in verse 6 of Revelation chapter 4, also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass as clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and back. This is uh, symbolic language. It's not going to be like a sci-fi movie, but what does it mean, eyes? God, basically, uh, it's representing that God is all-knowing and all-seeing. Like Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, everything will be laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The eyes of him. See, we think human being. No, God, that when anybody who reads that scripture, wherever they're at, in whatever timepiece, God sees them and sees us, sees that, you know, so it's, yeah, whoa. You know what I mean? We can't figure it out. We can make, we make analogies like, well, maybe it's like we know the telephone has all of us are on cell signals. You know, that's the best we can do. <laughs> we can't, that's a, that's a, you know, that can be everywhere. But that, we're talking about God. Look in Revelation 15, 2. And I think what the Bible does, Peter said, you know, he was fired up and he said, I had a good quiet time and I'm fired up. And, you know, Peter is a great, all of us have our own story. But, you know, Peter shared before that he came in from really having a struggle with drugs and alcohol, M- mainly uh, pharmaceutical pills, right? That'll kill you. I've watched documentaries on that. I've had to take medicine in L.A. because of my knees. And I'm just telling you, I took it the way they're supposed to give it to me. Because you can't, I don't even know how they, when they say people are dying on these pills, I don't even know how you get them. I, I guess it's under the table or something because I went to the doctor and even, even I'm crazy. It's like you, you have to kill yourself to get, they, they're so on you. But it's crazy, even if you have pain, I, I, I learned to be aware because even as a spiritual man, the opioid from the pain messes your brain up. And even if you know that and you have to go to faith, it just gives you kind of a, a contentness that's not real and it's temporary. And that's what we did in the world as idols. So you got to be careful, right? But Peter came from that grip of addiction and then the withdrawal is one of the hardest things. And, you know, just when you withdraw, even when you repent of sin and go from the darkness, you know it's truth. Think about the gravity of breaking free. You knew it was the truth, but you had to have that conviction of God and the reliance on God to break it, even though you knew it, right, and stay broken. But I'm just proud of you, bro, because I remember you talking over the time, period of time, and you've been open with everybody, but I'm seeing you fight, and I'm seeing this young, powerful man being formed before our eyes. And before, you were just a, a useless, young, another youth on drugs. I mean, really, think about it. You had no real rhyme or reason. You're just there. Now look at you. Come on. So if you look in uh, Revelation 15, verse 2, it says, And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea. Those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name, they held harps given to them by God. And... 
they sang the song of God's servant Moses, which is so powerful. Revelations in the future. We see the significance even when you read about Moses. He was a man, but it's so powerful to see that there, it reiterates in heaven a song that they sang in the desert. Isn't that powerful? So no longer, John is teaching from Revelations, we no longer will live, we don't have to live, we won't live in the unapproachable light. The Bible actually says that that we live in unapproachable light. God is in an unapproachable light, and, and I think it's in Timothy. You guys know that scripture? He is the God, the judge, the throne, the eternal God. He says he, he is in an unapproachable light. We can go before the throne of Christ with grace and find time of mercy, but you can't go before him until you die to see him. Unapproachable. It would destroy you and me. We're not, we're not even humanistically, we couldn't stand it. Isn't that powerful? But we're with God. And he redeems mankind and assumed, and he gives us new bodies. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 through 4. Um, you know, in 1 through 4, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, it says, We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because we, when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. You know, we're going to get new bodies. And now I know we can joke about that. <laughs> There's no, it's not like what you think. And, and if you're thinking of shortcuts, that's not the way God works either, right? It's not like a feel good, do it, you know. Uh, but it's not like even, I don't think it's going to be up there like the way we look at bodies, you know. Yeah. I don't think we're all going to be up there going, I want to be ripped. That would almost be self, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't that be self? Yeah. Well, if we were up in heaven, we'd all be struggling with arrogance again. Because if he gave us ripped bodies and that's what was important to us, then we'd all probably be wearing uh, tight shirts and muscle shirts going, hey, you doing? Trying to be humble, but how you doing? <laughs> but he's going to give us new bodies. <laughs> and why we should, the Bible does say, take care of your temple. Giovanni, I, I appreciate you speaking out loud because no one is to judge each other, but I appreciate the conviction. Uh, all of us need to have the conviction. Do the best with what we got. God wants to work in us. So, in, uh, you know, I just think it's very interesting. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven indicates the vision that's approaching John and uh, what he writes. Uh, and the evil empire was described as a great city, which was kind of nicknamed Babylon, which, which really is symbolic for the satanic, the world, the sinful world. You know, people can say, well, you're Los Angeles. That's a sin. That's, that's, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. No, bro, wherever, whatever little town you're in, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, it's funny because you say, you know, you'd say it's like Vegas, Sin City. No, you could be in Tucum, Cary, wherever, like small town USA. There's meth going on all over the place. Everybody's zombies. There's sin everywhere. It's like dark, dark everywhere outside of God, right? It's crazy. Sometimes we think, well, if I move out to the country and I'm in the wilderness in a smaller town, it'll be righteous. No. Sin is right there crouching at your door. The Bible says it desires to have you. You're never going to get away from it unless being Christ. So, uh, how about, let's look back at the roll call of hell. Because there's going to be a roll call for the saved. Fall in, saved, eternal people. We're all going to be pulled in before God. But there's also going to be a roll call of hell that Revelation talks about. Let's go back to Revelation 21, 8. Because it doesn't mean, but you should be grateful that you escaped that. You should be grateful that you escaped your sin. You never look at the people, but anybody who's here studying, any of the young men are looking into it, we're not saying we know where you are, but you're in a good place because you hopefully you see men that are understanding the truth more and more and, and being humble to the truth and making whatever they need to do. Maybe they, they aren't fully saved or whatnot, but you let the Bible be the humility. And then you've got living examples striving to live it and be humble. So you're in a good place. In Revelations 21.8, It says, uh, but the cowardly, 
the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Most of the sins on this list seem obvious enough to us. But what about the first one? That's always a kind of intriguing. Kind of cowardice. That's, you know, it's like, wow. When I first saw this as a young disciple, I was like, what? Cowardly, unbelieving? And then it gave me conviction when I was teaching people that said, I don't believe, that's fine for you. I went, they're not gonna, that's not a good enough excuse. If someone says, I don't believe, I don't believe in God, you, don't, you can't force or argue, but realize they, that's not an excuse. God's given them enough. That, the fact that you think that people just don't believe, sometimes we go, oh, no, no, you, you have to go, no, no, you, you, you need to believe God. You, you, you're not allowed to do that. You, you're, you're not allowed to do that. You're saying something that God says you're going to be held accountable for. So you, you need to be open because you will be able to believe if you're open. Because think about it, you're going to be, you're going to, that, that's like, that's in the line of not, of not no, no excuse. God's going to hold you accountable. Yeah. But cowardice, you know, uh, typically we would look at that character trait as viewing it as fairly, possibly, not that we want to do that, but possibly uh, in certain circumstances, normal and understandable. I don't think any of us have not been afraid of things or something, right? That's coward. If you, if you allow fear to get you, you're a coward. I'm a coward. So we're all cowards in the grace of God. It almost makes you go, well, I'm pure. And hopefully, brothers, you are pure. You have to fight that battle every day because I'm telling you, you need to repent when you fall because that Internet, once again, a great freedom of choice. You can have a computer, the freedom of choice in technology. You can have a computer. You can go anywhere and go and you can do anything you want. That's the freedom of choice God gave us. So he's saying, don't do it. Use it, but don't go there. It's like the tree, the fruit is right there. He says, don't eat from that tree. Everywhere our life is, it's the same thing with Eve. He's saying, everything is yours, freedom of choice, but there's a tree everywhere. I'm saying, don't do that. Yeah, but now, now God backs off and lets Eve decide what she wants to do, and that's what he does with us. So, come on. so you got to look at it that way, and you got to get convicted. Mm -hmm. And when you sin, you got to get convicted to get humble quick and be holy and godly, or you're going to run out of energy, and you're going to die slowly. Because that's what happens in your faith. Amen. Isn't that true? Those of us who had repented, those of us who had unfortunately been in different sins and we finally got open, weren't you like, I call it like Superman in front of kryptonite. You're just not you. You're dull. You just don't feel like it. You're easy, easier to make an excuse. Easier, just easier, easier, easier not to be where you need to be and be fired up. And then when you repent, you go, man, it takes a little bit of time. God forgives you. But now you got to get back into the strength of doing quiet times and conviction. And then, you know, the test is going to come because God's not mean, but he's going to go, you really repented. I'm, you're going to have to pass the test coming up or you're going to fall again. Because that proves you genuine. That's what God says. I got to prove you genuine. I'm going to put you in the next to the fire because I know you can do it because I died for you. But you must prove, be proved genuine in the fire. That's the test. And then when you do, you get stronger again. Amen. And you hopefully remember, I don't want to do that again. But most of us, you know, but God has another way of looking at cowardice, I think. Uh, all of us are fearful in circumstances, as I said, which is not sinful in and of itself. You walk outside of your yard in Florida in the country and there's a big black bear come eaten by your food. You're not going to walk up and go, let's pet it, honey. You're going to get in the house, get the chihuahua, hurry up, Right. Because you know, you, no matter how strong you are, four Afonso's I don't think could take on a big, grown, full-grown, charging bear that's hungry. Right? <laughs> what did you say? Help the what? Oh, that's funny. Help the bear. There you go. Come on. But let's look in 1 Corinthians 2, 3 about, let's look into cowardice because it's not just about not sharing your faith. It's about, it's about conviction. Because we're all going to, you know, that's another thing I want to tell you with the devil is that if we all looked at the way God says, the way that, that Satan wants you to look at it, you could be a failure every day. Because couldn't you do more on being open and share your faith? Couldn't you do more every day? Couldn't you? How does that feel if, you're look, if you take that as like, oh, oh, that's not the way you look at it. God is the one that allows the fruit. We need to be open and willing, but with all of us together as we grow, it doesn't mean you don't just go, well, someone else is going to do it, but you can't be accused. You're going to die. 
Because if you're really a disciple, you will be put in opportunities, and you will. But if you go every day, I mean, you, you know, don't, you, I don't, I'm not saying I, we need to be willing to go, God, lead me to someone and be faithful. But if you look at it like, you know, some of the campus students, I think sometimes, because they're, they're more open and with bigger crowds. But sometimes they could even look at like, you know, how many people did you share with today or something, right? That'll kill you, that question. What do you mean how many people I shared today? I'm praying. Just pray for me to share with somebody. It's going to happen if we're righteous and we're mature. We're going to grow. We're going to keep growing because we're righteous. God's going to lead people in our path, and then we'll speak up, and we'll get more bolder. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message was, and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Isn't that awesome? If you're willing to do what's right and you were willing to repent, then you don't beat yourself up. You go, God, forgive me. And he goes, that's great. Let's go. Because your nature, naturally, as God puts you in situations, you will be used. You'll get stronger. But it's not like do or don't, do or don't. You're just naturally either going to be a faithful disciple growing or you're going to fall away. I don't know. God says once you've been saved, he expects you to make it. So we should expect us to make it if we do what's right and repent. But even in a hard time, you need to repent. Look in Acts 18, verse 9. God warned, you know, God warned him not, uh, Paul, in a vision here where we're going to read, not to uh, let his fears deter him from the mission. And, uh, you know, the prayer for the Russian and the Ukrainian brothers, the, the sisters, the disciples over there, they are over there and you know, they've been scattered, dispersed. They're out of their own normal routine, but they, they can still have that unity through the movement and disciples, and they can still have a Bible. But it, in one sense, I'm sure it's driven them back to all I got is God. Because that's what God says, opportunities like that. It's not like we're wishing that on, but it's happened. In verse 9, it says of Acts 18, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. Isn't that awesome? So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the Word of God. Do you believe you have many people in Orlando? Yes. Well, just think about Sonia and I, we moved here. Sonia, my wife, that's my good news, by the way. I pick her up Friday. I made it. That was a test. <laughs> Woo! I don't think I could have made it myself. I'm strong with God, but I just miss my wife. 20, we, been, we had our anniversary while she was gone. We've been married 27 years. Amen. And I say that because that's a badge. That's another faithful thing. I give glory to God because if you're married in the kingdom, that's a glory badge. Being married, you can show people you can do it well. Still have battles, but you're open and you're humble and you're growing. Yeah. Right, married? Come, yeah. on. Come on. Come on. There you go. So that's why you, uh, you know, you need to get open. But look what Paul said, man. Paul said, I love how God says that to you guys. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. So you can't force people to be faithful. So that's where you're learning in wisdom on are you speaking to an open person? And as you're studying, it doesn't mean you give right up on people, but you never have to argue with a non someone that's in your faith. Just that's what the Bible says. You just share. And then I even say, I'm not trying to argue. with you. I'm just inviting you to something. To God, church, I mean, you go to the Bible, but I'm not to argue, and I don't mean to be, I don't mean to insult you, I don't know anything, I just know I'm just supposed, to, I'm just sharing. And then you get into studies, and you see, and then if they are honest with the scriptures, you continue to move with them and say, this is what I've been doing, this is what I need to do, this is what I'm still working on, right? But then if they argue with you, then you say, well, then you need to wrestle with this, because it's not about you and I, but this is what the Bible says. And, and realize you don't need, you just keep bringing them before them and then either they're going to do it or they won't. And then if they don't, you still say, oh, hey, I love you, man. Here's my number. But, you know, this is what the Bible teaches. Yeah. Yeah. Come on Sunday still. And if you don't want to study, just, let, you know, I think you should. But that's what you do. And then you, then you keep looking for open people, but you still let them know the door's wide open if they don't want to move forward. Because you've got to call someone once you start studying the Bible, sharing your faith in the discipleship study. They have to understand what does that mean to have a relationship with God? Well, this is what it means in way of life. So this is what it means to have a relationship with God because that's what you're teaching in first principles. 
all the way through. You're not teaching facts about what to do. You're teaching about intimately God's plan of a relationship with you individually and then coupled with people of God, a family, he calls it in the church. So it's not rules, it's walking with God. Isn't that awesome? So Paul, Paul experienced serious persecution sharing the message of Christ. Look in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. You guys with me? So, Chaz and Amy, how are you doing? I, I love these guys. You know, Sonia and I are in their lives, and as many of us were in each other's lives in marriage, but I just love how they're open when we get together, and that's why I'm grateful for Sonia to come back, because now she can help me. I'm, I've been doing the marriage counseling by myself. You know, I'm just <laughs> I love them both with all my heart. They have a new baby, but I love how they get open. And you guys don't mind. There's just things, but what it is is when you're married, it's funny how the little things, if you don't stay focused, can, can derail you. Just not, not just them, us too, all married. You think about, most marriage can think if you got in an argument and you had a fight, as time goes on, a few days later, if you cleared it up and you apologize, you don't even remember what the issue was. <laughs> most of the time, if you look at this, think how crazy that is. Yeah. That should be crazy in of itself. And most of the time, if you were humble husbands, even if your wife was wrong, you, you have an attitude because the husband must lead. So the husband must get humble first. The husband must go approach the sinful wife and say, let's talk, honey, even though you're all your fault. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. So guess what? I'm sorry you were made a man, but that's what you were made. So the man has a different role. The wife does need to get open, but you need to go. Why, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Oh, my gosh. I want to be a woman. <laughs> that's why the sinful devil is trying to tell people that they can change sexes. I don't like where I'm at. I'll become, I'm just kidding about that, but that, that's what the devil, that's crazy and another thing. But the man must, think about how challenging it is, but God gave you the strength to do it. And sometimes the courage to go to that wife. That wife can be, you know, I need, honey, we need to talk. And their emotions will go. But the husband must lead in humility and lead in being a peacemaker because he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ of the church. So you got to bite your tongue and pray. And don't worry about her side of the street and just go and go, I need to bring this unit, this two or one back in. And then I'm going to be responsible for myself and I'm going to get open. And usually when you start to do that, she's going to soften up anyway. But that's the power of God if you know your role. Okay. Wow. And you, even when you're weak, you can be weak in frustration and attitude. That's sin. When you're in sin, you're weak. But if you get bitter or argumentative or an attitude, you may think, but really now you've built this strong defense mechanism and you're not open anymore. That's weak. You're really weak, but you think you're in control. That's what happens when we get in sin. So 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 27, verse 23 says, Do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing. That's scripture, right? 11.23. Oh, excuse me. Right. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, wait, there it is. 11.23. Are they not, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I, I, am, I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the, from the Jews the 40 last, just minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night, a night and a day in open sea. We go to the beach for five hours and during the sun too long and we're done. It's frightening. You guys got to get tougher. We got, I got to get tougher. I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, in danger from false believers. Uh, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Talk about a spiritual maturity. Who is weak? I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? I do not, and, and, and I do not burn, inwardly burn. That means you are responsible and care about when there's sin with your brother or church. Not mad, not judgmental, but you realize it's, you see the battle beyond. This dude's struggling. Satan's getting a foothold. I got to get this guy to repent because it's going to hurt him in his relationship with God. It's going to hurt the church, and I got to have, someone's got to stand. Who's going to be the last person? If we, you got to go, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And you need to say that yourself. If I don't do it, who's going to do it? 
That's one of the reasons I come to church. Not because God needs me, but I go, I said Jesus is Lord. Paul was threatened with emotional and physical persecution. When we typically face the emotional, what happens? You got to think about this emotional persecution. And persecution is not just people chasing you, challenges of life. That's my biggest battle. I'm not having anybody shoot at me or barricade out my house yet, thank God. I've not been threatened violently to be, by being a Christian. I, I know there is stories, and I know brothers and sisters that are leading churches that this happens. I haven't had that at myself. In America, and I don't hear about it, probably. Has anybody heard about someone being physically beaten because they were a Christian in America? Yeah, we have a brother that happened to be. In America? Yeah, a brother that led into your church. You mentioned that in the sermon. But I mean, was he living, was he an American? He was an American when that happened. He someone had, beat him in America? Oh, because he had the Indian, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, well, that's true, the Indian culture. Some, that's the same, some people can have such a strong indignation and anger when they're in a religion. If you follow the truth, you could be disowned. And, and there is that, there's been people set on fire in India, beaten by their own family members. You don't, it does, it's like, it's, you got to understand, we're talking about the demonic stronghold on people. They're going to do things that don't make sense. Um, but... We are most afraid by the thought that we will be considered weird by those whom we share with, if we're honest. Not all the time, but it's just sometimes you can be sharing, and I get that way. I keep thinking, how do I explain to someone more than just church? And then I just got to go, I just got to get in a conversation, God, and help me. It, hopefully, if they're open, they want to talk a little bit. You know, you may say, hey, you go to church, but then I can think my, I can think my way out of it and go, what does that mean? It really doesn't mean anything. Most people church, it's like they'll get, take or leave it. But then I go, I can't, I just got to start and then hope I can get in a conversation. Isn't that true when you've shared your faith, you got a little bit more of a conversation? And that's where you got to realize that's the spirit. So don't even worry about it. Just do it. The very def definition of being a disciple of Jesus demands that we stand out from the crowd. Do you guys agree with that? Not in a bravado way, but we just are going to stand out and we're not going to apologize for what we believe in our convictions. God's people have always been that way. If you read this, that's why we're so in awe of the first century. But we, we do that here, guys. I'm proud of you. Believe it. In this world, being a disciple is really 101 kindergarten Christianity in God's sight. But it's so radical to the world. That's how lukewarm and watered down it's gotten. Think about it, when you become a disciple, a lot of people say you're, you're, going, to, you're going to church twice in a week. You're with your church people. Where are you going? You're with those church people again. I mean, people don't understand it. Even people who go to church don't understand it. Right? Because they don't have the mind of Christ. So you just got to pray for wisdom on how you explain about it's your faith. You don't get in tit for tat. Does that make sense? So the second death, let's just close on that because one thing I want to say is that if you're a disciple, that's a beautiful thing that you're going to avoid. The first death, none of us will avoid. But if you look back at Revelations 28, 21, 8, you've got to think about that. Because death comes to everyone. But one thing you, got to, you can revel in is like, wow, right now you can say, I'm not going to be included in that future. Because you made a decision to stand up for Jesus and become a true disciple, have your sins forgiven, receive his gift of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? You can say that right now, that this part you're not in. At the end of verse 8, right? This is the roll call for hell. This is what people fall into. And you know, liars is so powerful. Anytime you study the Bible with someone, you know, it's so funny that God doesn't, think God doesn't say, figure it out and try to see if they're lying. I love that we don't have to do anything but love them, let the word speak, and as they start to put it into practice, if they are being deceitful, it will come out, even if they're hiding it. No one can hide from God. And when they're stepping into God, you just got to love them and, and believe them because that's what we need to do, right? We were grateful people believed us. You don't have to be a detective or suspicious. Now you ask questions in love drawing people out. But you're only as sick as your secrets and they'll stay sick. Isn't that powerful? But it says here at the end, it says, adulterers and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. That's equating to being cast into hell. Completely dead relationship, no longer alive with God. No chance. See, people that are alive today that aren't right with God still get blessings from God, and God is going, I love you. 
I love you. My son died for you. We're bringing that message. He loves them. He even gives them food and rain and blesses them and lets them work their abilities. And he's trying to get them. I gave this to you. See, God loves everybody. But the second death is when that's it. Eternity's fixed. You don't have that. Isn't that great to know a reason why you come to church, a reason why you read your Bible, a reason why you share your faith? Because you're walking with God. The basic meaning of death is what? Separation. If someone dies the first death, when we lose a loved one or someone loves a loved one, the pain of losing the relationship is what kills people in memory. They mourn because they had someone. that we'll, We're going to go through that, guys, if you haven't already. You know, it's really weird because I'm getting older and I realize when I was younger, no one really died close to me. I used to think about that. When I became a disciple, I went, I, I hadn't had anybody really die close to me. My grandfather was the first person that died close to me, and that's where I felt that feeling of separation. Just because I had a rapport with him, I respected him, I, was, I had endearment, I had memories to this day. That's what that means. Death just means separation. The first death, we're all going to feel mourning when we lose someone. It doesn't matter where they're at spiritually. If they were endeared to us, we're going to miss them. And then the rest, you've got to surrender to God. Look in James 2.26. So I think even that, you have to prepare your minds to handle death. And that's why God gave you grieving and we encourage each other. And we do have a time of mourning and greeting. Jesus wept. That's normal. But prepare yourself spiritually when that stuff tries to happen. I'm proud of Melvin because he's still in it, but he surrendered. But his mom's still on life support. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, if she doesn't come to, they're going to have to eventually make a decision. He's had to work through that, encourage him. But he's worked through it. There's nothing he can do. That's what he's saying. James 2.26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Mentions that the body without the spirit is dead. Thus physical death occurs when the spirit is separated from the body in which it resides. The second death is a man's separation from his maker. And let's close out here in 2 Thessalonians Chapter 1, verse 9, and I'd love some responses, just how it hits you. Hopefully you're encouraged. I was hoping to come in tonight and go, let's look into the window of the truth of the future of what we have in God. And that's what the Bible does, too. The Bible gives us a lot of reminders of what we have now and what we get. you got to focus on that, too, and be grateful. And in verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his, in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. So is the Marvel, Marvel movies, is that what that means? Marvel, it's so marvelous. Marvel, do you guys marvel at the superheroes? It's interesting how that says that in your marvel. That means we're just like God's like you can't even imagine. Like you go to the movie and see these superheroes, you know, it's, we all know it's fake. But that's funny how it says marvel. We're going to be marveling at God. So, see, in this life, no person has any idea of what, it, of what being really separated totally from God will be like. Even when we were not saved. We're now we're saved. But we still, that's why people are so slow to respond. Because God's love and kindness is still coming on them, even though they're not saved. That's a challenge. That's where you got to realize it's all God. You just got to use the love. And if they're open, it's, it's God doing it. We just plant water. That's what you gotta, really got to realize that. But they, no one has an idea. Even us, when we die, we're going to realize how grateful we are. But imagine, a lot of people believe in God, but they're not saved. But they don't know that, or they don't believe that part. But the scriptures are the ones that dictate the judgment. But think about that, guys. No person has any idea of what being separated totally from God will be like. Because we haven't died yet. And the Bible says in Matthew 5, 45, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So God says that's why. People experience God's kindness now. But just understand what you have. It's amazing. If you're here, guys, and you guys, some of you young guys I've met, I don't know where you're at, but if you're studying, get your answers. Ask, 
who's studying with you, keep studying. Let the word of God be the authority of your life because that's what God uses. God is spirit and the word of God is truth. And those of us who have it, continue to remind each other and be grateful for every single thing, good or bad, it happens. God be the glory. Let's open up for some responses. <laughs>